telling other people that you are someone who follows Jesus does not mean that you follow Jesus. In fact, your following of Jesus will be verified by one thing and one thing alone. Fruit. The fruit of your life. The fruit that gets produced out of your life. Jesus said this. This isn't my word. You don't have to take my word for it. That's fine. Jesus said that when you're trying to discern the character of somebody's life, the content of their message, here's the thing. You can identify them, he said, by their fruit. I want you. That's the reason we're doing this series. I want your life. I want your faith to be verified. But can I tell you what I want more than that? I want your life, your faith to produce fruit. Because then being verified will take care of itself. Like our lives become verified, not because we manipulate something, not because we fabricate something, not because we try to control something, but because what begins to come out of our life because we have Holy Ghost power on the inside of us is that we begin to bear fruit. And like Jesus said, fruit that will last. And so with that, I am so glad you are here for the second installment of our series, Verify, where we are trying to do just that. We're trying to bear fruit. I'm trying to show you what it means, show you what it looks like, show you how to get verified by bearing fruit. What kind of fruit, you may say? Well, if you're new with us today, or maybe today is your first time you missed part one, first of all, go back and watch part one. It's available on our YouTube channel. The podcast is there. You can listen to that. But we're bearing fruit as articulated to us by the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians chapter 5. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, we find this list that is serving as a foundation for us when it comes to this fruit that we are to bear, this fruit that should last. And the Apostle Paul writes these words in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. He says this. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is the fruit we're concerned with bearing. This is the fruit we're concerned with demonstrating up here in this series. This is the fruit that will verify your life, verify your faith. The fruit of the Spirit is what, Paul? Well, it's love, it's joy, it's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says against such things, there is no law. Now, this list, as it appears here, uh, is relatively easy to articulate about and relatively easy to define on some level. I mean, there's not one of these fruits of the spirit that if we weren't taking open answers in the chat, that somebody, everybody couldn't give us some sort of definition on. You could tell us what you think gentleness means or self-control means or what it means to be good. You could put definition to all of that. In fact, we learned in part one, even uh, our definition when it comes to love. Some of us have this definition of what it means to love, but here's the rub in this series. Here's the real question that we're wrestling with continuing on today. Do we define these the way God does? Is God's definition of peace your definition of peace? Is God's definition of, of kindness or of self your definition? Or are they different? Because the fruit that we're to bear, the fruit that will verify us, is not just because we do something or we call it what we want and we say, oh, well, this is what it means to be patient. And God's like, nah, not so much. See, that's the tension. That's what we discovered in part one. If you watch part one or join us in person or listen to the podcast, you learn that as we approach the love, so many of us have ideas and understanding of what love is. But Jesus taught us that love was really to love those who are our enemies, to pray for those who make our life hard, to do good to people, even when they don't do good back to us. That is is love. And that kind of love in your life will verify your life. Now today in part two, we are going to move into the second fruit. And it's one that quite honestly, we all could put some definition to. Because we're all, at least of our own definition, pursuing this thing. Everybody knows and everybody pursues their definition of joy. Come on, everybody wants to be 
happy. Am I right? Come on, it's the pursuit of happiness. I see you, Will Smith, in your sad movie. Like, like it is this desire to enjoy life, to enjoy our, our, our reality. I want joy. I want to experience joy. There ain't a person, whether you're a person of faith, whether you're not a person of faith today, that doesn't want that. In fact, there's a good bit of you that you wake up in the morning and the work that you do, the conversations that you have, the places you go and don't go are in pursuit of joy for you. The problem is, is our definition of joy and God's definition of joy might be very different things. If you're taking notes on today, would you write this down? Because most people think that joy is, and you can write this in your notes, a satisfaction that depends on the situation. When we talk about joy, most people think that that's what joy is. It is this satisfaction based on the situation that transpired. If the events go the way I want the events to go, if what happens is what would be good for me or what I hoped would happen, then we find ourselves thinking that we have achieved some element or sensation of joy. If your team wins the title or wins the game or wins the series, there is this euphoric feeling that comes over you. And, and some of us think that that is joy. And so we hope and we pray and we want our team to win. Some of us ain't even got real allegiances to a team we just jump on the bandwagon of whatever team is good. I see you, Alabama fans. <laughs> yeah, I see all you Patriots fans. Yeah, 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 you ain't even been to New England. But we jump on the bandwagon of a team just to be able to chase that euphoric feeling. Because some people believe that a satisfaction that depends on the situation, that's joy. When the when the outcome of something goes your way, that feeling that you get when the candidate that you, you stunted for wins the election, they become mayor or they become the, the they get the seat on the school board or, or they become the governor or they become the president or they become whatever. That, woo, we won. A lot of people trick themselves into thinking that that is joy. When the predicament that you find yourself in just goes good for you and it makes life easy for you, we call that joy. Most people think that joy is a satisfaction that depends on the situation. Or they think it is, write it down, a life that depends on the location. Come on, this, this, this feeling and feeling, this life, it is life to me that depends upon the place that I am. So if we are able to buy that house, come on, if I could just move in to that apartment, woo, I will feel such joy. Or have you ever noticed how much more people want to talk about where they are and where they're staying and how they're living and what they're eating when they're on vacation? They don't be doing that during the week. They just be having peanut butter and jelly at the house. Ain't nobody Instagramming that. But you find themselves on vacation, you be like, look at my life. Because we've tricked ourselves into thinking somehow that the location is what brings us joy. That the space that we find ourselves in, the place that we find ourselves in, and if I could just be in the mountains, I'll have joy. And if I'll just be on the beach, I'll have joy. And if I could just be in another city, or if I could just be by the lake, or if I could just be, then I'll have joy. Most people think that joy is a satisfaction that depends on the situation, or a life that depends on the location, or a comfort that depends on the crowd. That when I get the right people around me, when the right people know me, when they know my name, when I walk into the room and they address me and they say, hey, it's good to see you. We wanted you here. I'm so happy. When that happens, then joy will come to us. Here's the problem, friend, because this is our perception of joy. Many make that perception their pursuit. 
And what happens is because this is how many of us have defined joy. It's about a situation. It's about a location. It's about a crowd. It's about the people I can get around me. It's about the places I can go. It's about the outcomes that I can manufacture or have or control or receive for myself. That that is what brings joy. That that is how I find joy. And so they make the pursuit of that perspective what their life is about. They literally make the attaining of those things. If we could just live in a neighborhood. Come on, if we could get them to be our friends. Come on, if, if I could throw a party and have all these people. If, if this situation would work out for me, if I could get that raise, then I'd have joy. Come on, if I could get that title, then I'd have joy. And we make the pursuit of those things. Our joy. But I need to set the record straight on today before we get too much further here at Church Online today. Joy is not a purpose. It is a byproduct of living on purpose. I'm going to say it again. Make sure you write it down. It's right here. You write that down in your notes. Joy is not a purpose. It's a byproduct. It's something that can come along the way of a life lived on purpose. Catch me. This is going to sting a little bit, but I'm trying to pop the American bubble. I'm trying to crush your American dream just a little bit so that you can walk in God's dream. The purpose of your existence is not your joy. The reason you're sucking air on today, the reason you have life in your body and strength in your bones is not just so you can find your Joy. That's why people live their whole life with no values and they live contrary to God and his word and what he says to do because they believe the pursuit of joy as they define it is the purpose of their life. But when joy is actually supposed to be a byproduct of a life lived on purpose. If you make joy your purpose, here's what happens. You will live selfishly, no matter what. If you make joy your purpose, you finding joy, you achieving joy, you experiencing joy, particularly connected to the definition that many of us bring to the idea that is joy. If you make joy your purpose, you will live selfishly, no matter what. No matter where you find yourself, no matter what you do, no matter where you go, you will find yourself preoccupied with yourself because your joy, your outcome, your people, your location matters more than everything because you're pursuing it. And it'll become all about you. And if you make your joy your purpose, you will live selfishly no matter what. But please write this down. If you make Christ your purpose, you will live joyfully. No matter what. Now, I know somebody just probably amen in the chat or amen in their living room. And that's great. But, you know, your boy is a um, down to earth individual. I don't just preach with platitudes that do not have practicality to them. And if I'm being honest, the statement you just wrote down and that I told you to write down can feel like one of those. Make Christ your purpose and you'll live joyfully. No matter what. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Like, what does that mean? How does that happen? And is that even true? Well, I want to do work over these next several moments. And I really want you to lean in today. Because I want your life to be verified by the joy that comes out of it. But if joy is your pursuit, the joy that you need, the joy that will last, the joy that will bear much fruit, the joy that will verify your life is not what will come out of you. But if you make Christ your purpose, you will live joyfully, no matter what. See, if you were to approach the scriptures via Google, and Google, talk to me about joy in the Bible, or something to that effect. Google will lead you to a book in the New Testament called Philippians. It is literally thought of by scholars, theologians, and the Google as 
a book of joy. And I want to lean into the wisdom of this book of joy in a couple of different places as we explore God's word together and get verified with joy on today. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. This is what the Apostle Paul writes in this book of joy. Please listen closely. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advance of the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is in the cause of Christ. Most of the brothers in the Lord have gained confidence from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the message freely. We need some context here in this book of joy. What, um, what has happened to you, Paul? Well, um, the book of Philippians is written by Paul. Clearly, he identifies himself. But it's written from prison. He says it right here. My imprisonment. He talks about the imperial guard is being affected because of what has happened to me. Now, people that really study this and, and scholars that like to debate on the nuance and the specificities of when exactly this happened, when exactly that happened, kind of go back and forth on when exactly Paul was in prison. Because Paul was in prison a couple different times, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and one of those times that people think he may have written Philippians, he was in a jail, like a jail jail, like locked up in some governmental facility behind bars. Um, there was another time that Paul spent two years in jail, but that jail was house arrest. And many people believe that he wrote the book of Philippians and a couple others that are referred to as the prison epistles, these letters that he wrote while in prison. And they believe that he wrote them. Either way, it doesn't matter whether you got him in jail, like locked in a house that he can't leave, and he's got a Roman guard standing outside the door, a Roman guard attached to him, so that way he don't get away because they got to they, they, they talk to Paul, or whether you see him in a cell. Here's the thing. Nobody would say that a time in prison is a good time. But Paul sees it differently. Because he does not judge, you better catch this, he does not judge any situation based on the situation, but based on what comes out of the situation. He doesn't view his life and view what happens to him as being good or bad, as being joyous or depressing, based on the situation, but based on what happens out of the situation. That is why I can announce to you today that nothing that happens to you can take your joy from you. That's good news. <laughs> nothing that happens to you can take your joy from you. But so many of us, the way we live our lives is we give the circumstances of our lives, we give the events, the traumatic ones, the good ones, way too much credit because we allow joy as we define it to come to us if the right situation happens and we allow joy to be taken from us if the wrong situation, as we define it, happens to us. Nothing that happens to you can take your joy from you. Paul is in prison and he's full of joy. And he's not in prison even the way you would think he's in prison. See, prison was... Being locked up in that day. But it wasn't being locked up and then being cared for in your most basic needs by the government. You did not get clothes and meals every day. No, a prisoner in Paul's day only was able to eat based on the generosity of family or friends who would remember them while they're in jail and bring food to them and for them. And here's Paul, traveling missionary Paul, itinerant preacher Paul, Paul who is single, by the way, 
locked up in prison, wondering where his next meal is coming from because it ain't coming from this guard. Wondering if anybody remember, does anybody in Ephesus, does anybody in Corinth, does anybody remember me? Timothy, <laughs> that time we spent together, do you remember me? He is locked up, worried about if he'll ever get to eat again. But yet sees this situation as an opportunity for joy to spread, for joy to grow, because the gospel gets spread. You see, anything, any situation in your life could be used to spread joy. God can use the worst day of your life to spread his message and bring joy to you. God can use tragedy that hits you out of nowhere to spread his message and bring joy to you. God can use sickness. He can use loneliness. He can use loss. He can use heartache. He can use jail time. He can use anything because nothing that happens to you can take your joy from you. But the reason we don't see this is because when difficulty comes to us, what we do is we hide the difficulty or we remove them instead of leveraging them. We think that joy will come to us the more polished our persona. That joy will find us the more refined. If I can, if I can crop this image enough, if I can filter it and clean it up enough, Maybe on the back side of it, people will see something that's not even true and bring joy to me by their validation of what I know isn't even true. I have uh, been a communicator for a while. I obviously preach spaces like this online and in person. I, I, I speak in other spaces, at other events, and other venues. Other churches, I, uh, I, I, I speak at civic gatherings. I speak to businesses from time to time. I talk to people that, I talk to people a lot. And I have learned something as a communicator that we often forget as individuals, that people are impressed by your strengths but they identify with your struggle. Oh, oh, your greatness and your strength and your affluence and your prosperity and the blessing on your life, people are like, oh, must be nice to be them. But they identify with your struggle. People resonate and connect with a you that everything has it, like my grandmama used to say, turned up tulips and popped up petunias. Like, like people resonate with the you that has a hard day. People resonate with the you that made a plan and things didn't go according to plan. It, it connects you to people. But most people view their setbacks and struggles as just that. Setbacks and struggles instead of seeing them as the thing that might give somebody else hope. So when our situation gets difficult and when our situation is taxing, we say, as Paul did, but with a different tone to our voice, what has happened to me? All my problems. Ain't nobody love me. What has happened? Nobody cares about me. Nobody invites me over or invites me in. Oh, they, they love, they dote over those people. They don't like me anymore. My industry, you know, it's really been hard working in the industry I work in since, since the COVID. It's, a, it's my suffering. It's my childhood. It was so hard. And it was. And we think somehow if we had different circumstances, then we'd have joy. We view every difficulty as what has happened to me and we stop rather than
rather than looking forward to what might be able to happen in you, to you, and for others because of what has happened to you. I have news for you today. If Jesus hasn't changed, your joy doesn't have to change. Come on, if Jesus hasn't changed, the scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus hasn't changed, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If Jesus hasn't changed, you can be sure of this, I am with you always. If Jesus hasn't changed, your joy doesn't have to change. And can I tell you, this is the conviction of Paul in Philippians. He's in prison. Talk about good things coming out of it. He's in prison. And folk have gained confidence from his struggle. That's what he said. He said, I'm in prison. But I hear testimony. And I see. And I know. And I watch the news. And I see that there are people who their faith is being built up because of what I'm going through. Can I ask you a question on today? Who has gained confidence from your struggle? Who has had their faith encouraged, lifted, strengthened because of how you went through what you went through? Y'all ain't talking to me today. Somebody need to, somebody need to holler at me in the chat. Who has gained confidence because of what you've gone through? See, I came to tell you today. God can use anything you allow him to use. He can use anything. He can use the difficult seasons of your life because he can use that imprisonment. He can use you not being able to do the thing you were supposed to do if you'll let him use it. How do I let him use it, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. Write this down. Stop looking for pity. A lot of us have substituted the pursuit of purpose that will bring us joy for pity. See, when you look for pity, that search will become your purpose. We want someone to feel for us. And so we vent on Facebook, because y'all know Facebook algorithm, I don't know much about the algorithm, but I'll tell you this, it loves negativity. <laughs> So if you start hollering, you start dropping the, 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 you know, the, the angry colored face emojis up in there. You start calling people names, calling them everything but a child of God. It's amazing how all of a sudden all your friends that never see your post will start seeing that post. Just get angry. And then their likes or their hugs or their comments saying, you ought to tell him he is a dog. Like, like all of that will start to fuel you because you have made pity your purpose. We mope around. Talk about nobody loves me. Nobody calls me. You know, them phones work two ways. Nobody, nobody cares about me anymore. They said they loved me, but I, I, and we just mope around. We disconnect ourselves relationally. We isolate ourselves from people, from family from the purpose that God even has for our life. And we do it to attract pity. Some of us just are waiting on somebody to notice that we've been, we've, been, we've been intentionally absent because somehow we've tricked ourselves into thinking that they're noticing that we uh, made ourselves absent on purpose will bring us joy when they notice us. So we look for any opportunity to complain. Because it's amazing how people will lean in and be like, you better tell them. Yeah, I didn't like it either. We tell people all about our struggles because we're looking for pity. The sad reality is that our life's work becomes collecting pity. You ain't got to write that person's name in the chat. Don't do that. Don't look at them right now if they sit next to you in the living room. No, no, no. But you know people. Maybe you are people who have made your pursuit, the pursuit of pity. How can God use anything? You got to allow him to use it. 
And the first step in this allowance is to stop looking for pity and write this down. Start looking for purpose. Start looking for purpose. Because when you look for purpose, you'll even find some joy in the search. Take the difficulty, the betrayal, the struggle, the setback, and rather than try to use it as fuel to gain pity, start to use it as something that you say, what has happened to me here? And start looking for purpose in this problem. God, how are you going to use this betrayal? God, how are you going to use them lying on me? God, how are you going to use, like Paul, my imprisonment? God, how are you going to use, how are you going to use this bankruptcy? God, how are you going to use me losing my job? God, how are you going to use me losing a child? How are you going to use this? Then, the joy you want will come from discovering purpose out of the difficulty that you don't. The joy you're looking for will come from discovering purpose from the difficulty that you don't even want to have. How do I know this? Man, I see it all the time. I am a, I'm a, a big sports fan. I love sports. But I don't just like to watch the games. I enjoy all things sports. I enjoy reading writers and bloggers and such talk about nuances of sports. I, I, I love listening to people talk about, not just games, but talk about what's happening in front offices and, and trades and ideas and what's happening in the structure of this league and that. I love sports. And the thing that's interesting about sports following on that level today is many of the people who cover sports full time uh, are not like they used to be. Used to you had like one job. I remember being a kid watching Sports Center and, and Dan Patrick did Sports Center basically five nights a week. Like and he was on there. And Stuart Scott was on Sports Center five nights. And that's all they did. <laughs> that is all they did. It ain't that way anymore. You have to be a uh, multidisciplinary. <laughs> you have to write and you have to talk and you have to be on video, and you're in all these different places. And what has happened is you find certain voices or certain people that you like, you know, I really like listening to them talk about sports. Or I really enjoy what they have to say about this thing. Or they are passionate about the NBA. Like, I'm passionate about the NBA, so I'm going to lean into them. And one of those that has been that for me is a guy that has worked for this organization called The Ringer, a guy by the name of Jonathan Sharks. And Jonathan Sharks has been a very vocal Jesus follower, which is very um, unexpected around the network that is The Ringer. Because The Ringer would not be uh, considered an organization that holds high Christian values or perspectives at all. <laughs> In fact, maybe the opposite. But Sharks has worked there, and he was one of their lead basketball writers. He'd be on podcasts talking about basketball. I loved his perspective. I loved his insight. But about two years ago, Sharks was diagnosed with cancer, a form of cancer that had already spread all throughout his body and a form of cancer that basically they could treat to try to give him a few more days or weeks or months, but would not cure it. Chunks was not old. At the time, I believe he was 32 years old when he found this cancer diagnosis. And over the course of about the last 18 months or so as he battled this, he would speak and write very openly, powerfully about his faith. Because here he is with cancer in every fiber of his body. Here he is fully aware with the reality that his one-year-old son, when he got this diagnosis of cancer, he was not going to be able to write. He would not see him graduate from high school, much less maybe even start kindergarten. But he would talk about his deep faith in God. And he would talk about how his faith has given him purpose. 
Sharks died this last week. And it has been amazing for me to see the impact of somebody like that. As I have watched person after person that I feel like I know, like I feel like I knew sharks, who I know don't have a faith in God like sharks did. Celebrate him and celebrate the content of his character and, and celebrate his deep faith. And who knows what God is doing in them because of the boldness that sharks had as he, as he fought cancer. And it's terrible. Here's a young mom with a three-year-old son who, who now is one day going to have to talk about how, how dad lost his life to cancer and a, a young son who's never going to have his dad be there for him, never going to take him to the baseball games, not going to sit down and watch movies with him, not going to teach him how to edit videos on his iPad. None of that's going to get to happen. But yet somehow he, uh, he found purpose leveraging this incredibly difficult thing to bring hope to others. And if you could have asked him, you would have found out that uh, even though he was suffering in his body, joy filled him. Oh, I see it on, on simple, tangible levels literally almost every day of our life, my life. There's a lady who serves with our church, uh, through a partner organization that we, uh, that we work with. Some of you know we serve hundreds of meals every day, Monday through Friday, for free to kids because there are massive food insecurities and needs in our city. And so at the front of our building, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, our yellow tent is set up and from 3 to 5 p.m. or until we run out of food, which is every day, but we are out there serving meals. And the lady that does that, the lady that leads that is a lady named Ms. Lois. And over the last almost two years now, Miss Lois has become a good friend of mine because she's here five days a week. You ain't here five days a week. She, you know, like uh, she's here five days a week. And so getting to talk her, to her and see and know her more. And there's this beautiful tension that I see in her. Because on one hand, Miss Lois, from a, a material perspective, doesn't have a lot. Every week is going to be tight. Every month's going to be a struggle. But she has a smile on her face. And she's out there serving and blessing. I tell you, if Miss Lois misses a day or Miss Lois is running late and I have to serve them or somebody else does, you know what the question is? Where Lois? <laughs> Where your friend at? And I go, oh, she running late and she took the day off. You know, like, like because of the joy she gives to other people. I've watched Lois over and over and over again bring things from her own house to feed other people, bring clothes that she had collected to give to people that don't have as much clothes as she does. She takes care of people. And even though it'd be very easy for her to sit and mope and complain about what she doesn't have, she chooses to see her life as an opportunity to be a blessing to other people. And I'll tell you, because she'll tell you, she finds joy in the process. I saw it in my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, Mindy's mom, Kathy, passed away about two years ago. She spent about six years battling cancer. Thought they had beat it. Had a kind of intermission, if you will, where everything was cool. And then it came back, and it was cancer that took her life. The thing is, is some of you know this that know me a little bit. I've known Mindy since middle school. And she was my, she was, she's been my forever crush. Not was, she still is. My forever crush, right? And so I have known her family as long as I've known her. And all of that really was rooted through church. And as long as I've known Kathy... She loved Jesus. She believed in the local church. And yet I saw something, especially the second time, that cancer came back and filled her body that was different about her. She became more vocal about sharing the hope found in Jesus. 
she became more intentional about telling people about what God had done in her life, about, about helping people realize that even though cancer is taking her life away, it cannot take her joy away. Because hear me, if your difficulty doesn't help others yet, the reason is, is because you haven't trusted God with that difficulty yet. And she understood it. And Lois understands it. And I believe Chalks understood it too. That my difficulty may be overwhelming. And I can use this to garner pity. I can use this to get people to feel sorry for me. But I cannot garner pity with it and use it for purpose at the same time. And I want purpose more. I want to make a difference with whatever God has given me. And I want to use it for the honor of his great name. And he can use anything. He can use cancer in my body. He can use struggle as a, as a reality of my life. He can use my limitations. He can use my imprisonment, Paul. He can use all of it if you'll let him. But you've got to start looking for purpose. Some of you speak so despairingly over every difficulty in your life. I got to work three jobs. How about I got to work three jobs? My kid has a learning disability. My, my friends have turned their back on me. The man who said he'd be there with me for the rest of my life cheated on me, walked out on me. And we look at our difficulties And we want them to go away. Rather than looking at them and saying, God, what purpose do you want to bring through this? Who do you want to help because of what I'm going through? Because of my struggle, because of my addiction, because of my battle, because of all that I'm facing. Who do you want to help because of what I'm going through? You have to start looking for purpose. Because when you start looking at whatever that difficulty is and looking for the purpose inside of it, something's going to happen in you. Oh, and maybe you'll be like Paul <laughs> in a situation that don't make no sense, in a situation that's difficult. You find yourself in prison and you say, like Paul did, what has happened to me? <laughs> Not because you're obsessed about the difficulty, but because the difficulty didn't stop you no more. Hey, <laughs> because you because now you, you used to would have lost your mind if somebody told you they didn't need you to work there anymore. But now you have this this confidence that can't be shaken. And I don't know what God's going to do through this. I don't know how God's going to provide for me, but I'm certain that he can. I'm certain that he will because I've seen that he has. I have a joy that you cannot take from me. Uh, you can give me a bad doctor's report and used to I would have lost my mind I would have gone back to my vice but not anymore because I know that there's purpose in this I just don't see it yet I used to would have taken that information and gone off and gotten depressed but I'm learning to trust God with it because there's purpose in it but you have to see the purpose of your life is something different. See, if enjoying your life is your primary goal, you'll never know joy in this life. If the goal of your life is to enjoy your life, you'll never know joy in this life. Oh, you'll have some neat moments. You'll have some enviable experiences. But you'll never know joy. You'll be happy from time to time. But you'll never know joy because our world is broken and life is hard and crazy things happen and bad stuff happens to people who were not expecting it. And young fathers find out that they've got cancer and people that feels like I ain't never done nothing wrong have never caught a financial break in their life. Bad stuff happens. And if enjoying your life is your primary goal, you'll never know joy in this life. But hear me. If releasing your life is your primary goal, you'll always know joy in this life. Releasing? Yeah. That's what Paul did. See, he would continue on his teaching in chapter 2, verse 17, and offer us this 
instruction that I want to bring to light to you as we close. He says, but I will rejoice. This is Paul in prison. I will rejoice. I got a Roman guard attached to me. I will rejoice. I don't know if anybody has remembered me anymore to send me some food, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life. Pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share in that joy. I will rejoice even if I lose my life. Pouring it out like a drink offering, a liquid offering to God. See, Paul clarifies something that we wrongly assume, and it leads us to a misguided definition, a misguided pursuit of joy. We think joy comes from a filling of our life. But Paul says joy comes from empty our life. See, God is this source that can supply and he never runs out. And we think the joy of our life. Is God filling our life. We think the joy. Comes from filling us up. But Paul says the joy. Comes from when we pour our life. God fills us, but it's the filling. That's not what brings the joy. It's the filling that some of us want so desperately. We say, I want God to fill me. I want God to do this. But you've got to understand, friend, it's the poor. That Paul says brings the joy. See, because God has you here right now. And it's not just for you to enjoy him. It's for you to serve him by taking whatever it is he fills you with in this life. However much, however little, for however long, you take whatever he fills you with and you pour it out. And that's where you'll find joy. You know, I misunderstood this for a long time, too. I thought the joy was when God filled my life. So I'd pray for God to bless me. And I'd pray for God to increase. And I'd pray for God to provide. And I'd pray for God to heal. But the joy doesn't come from what God brings to me. The joy... comes from the poor. You know, there was an old song. Some of y'all don't know this. There's an old church song. It used to say, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Come on, somebody sing it in the kitchen. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. And I used to think this because, oh, that's because God is the one that fills me. But I understood it wrong. Because the world can even distort my perception of where my filling comes from. God can bless me and I can think it's my effort. God can provide and I can think it's my job. But my joy doesn't come from my filling. Fill me up. But my joy doesn't come from here. My joy comes from the pouring. You see, it's the joy of serving. Oh, if you've ever really served, you know there's joy in that. There's joy when you take your energy, when you take your talent, and you use it for the glory of God. 
and for the good of people around you. There's joy in that. There's joy that comes to you. It can't nobody, because can't nobody stop you from serving. Can't no, there's joy from giving. When I, when I pour out my resources, when I pour out my time, when I pour out my energy and I give, there is joy in that. And I find joy in the poor. I find joy when, when my struggle and my difficulty and my pain gets repurposed as I, as I pour it out. See, you don't get joy for the poor. You get joy from the poor. Some of you think that this is what will fill you with joy. Friend, some of you are sitting with a full bucket right now and no joy. God has blessed your life. He's blessed relationships. He's blessed your finances. He's blessed, he's blessed every area of you. Your bucket is full. And you have no joy. And any bump in the road feels like you're stealing your joy. You get joy. From the poor. You get joy. As you pour your life out. Paul, why you got joy in prison? You should see what's happening in other people. How, how you got joy even though you just lost your job? There's joy in the poor. How you, how you got joy even though you gave up a whole Saturday, whole Saturday morning to serve people growth? Because there's joy in the poor. How you got joy because you didn't even go to service that last Sunday? Because I serve kids. There's joy in the poor. How, how you get joy even though it seems like difficulty after difficulty, month after month is coming on you because there's joy in the poor. And even if I pour out every single drop that God has given me, it was all an offering to him. And I see what he's doing for others now. And so there's joy in that poor. Friends, today I want you to get verified. So let me ask you a question. Where is God telling you to pour? And you won't. Some of you have difficulty that God wants to use. You have trauma and tragedy that you have tried to hide and cover up that God wants to use. And he's saying, I've blessed, I've blessed you with that difficulty to pour it out. You survived abuse. You survived that divorce. You survived that heartache. And I want to use it. Why are you trying to hide it? S some of you, it's in your finances. God has blessed you financially. You, you've held a job through all COVID, all the people going back to work, not going to work, all this good, and you have had money coming in. You've been consistent in your job, and you thought it was because you were so good. And God's like, I have blessed you to be able to pour, but you are so stingy. And that's why money for you feels so stressful. You know, the joy financially is in the poor. Some of you have strength in your body, talent in your bones, and you won't use it for God. There's joy in the poor. Where is God telling you to pour and you won't? What I'm telling you to do this week, friend, is to pour there. Some of you need to sign up to serve this week. Some of you need to start looking at your difficulty and figure out, God, how are you going to use this? You need to start praying. God, I give this, this situation to you. I give this difficulty to you. I give my past to you. Will you use it? Will you use it? Will you use it? Because right when you think you're empty, he can pour more in. He ain't ever going to run out. And then one day, as God fills you, you become somebody people think of as generous. And you become somebody people think of as faithful. And you become somebody people, people look to as somebody who's been able to navigate a whole lot of difficulty. But you know who you were. And you'll look back at how you used to be and say, what has happened to me? 
I, I used to I used to be so concerned with what other people think. What has happened to me? I used to be so stingy. What has happened to me? I used to be so selfish and preoccupied. What has happened to me? What has happened to me is that I found purpose for everything God allowed and everything God brought. And as I poured it out, I found the joy I've always wanted. Can I pray for you today, Father? I pray today you bring purpose to every person. Purpose to their pain, purpose to their trauma, purpose to their difficulty, purpose to the things they don't understand, purpose to the, the tragedies that happen, purpose to the blessings of their life. And as they begin to pour, Father, I pray that they would see joy like they've never known before because their life has become a drink offering to you. God, use them, use it for the honor and glory of your great name so that they, like Paul, could say, what has happened to me? God, God has used what I thought he couldn't use. God has used what I used to hold on just for me. God has used everything he's given to me. And that has brought me joy. I love you. I thank you, Jesus, for all you're doing in us and through us. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.